Hello everyone and welcome back to Progress America Unfiltered. It's me, Tyler, and we've got a full house today with Rhett, Jocelyn, and Craig, and we are going to start a new segment that we're calling Everyday Nightmares. Dun, dun, dun. Cue the spooky music. I don't know. Maybe this is perfect for fall as we prepare for Halloween, but... We've got an exciting episode of Everyday Nightmares to kick us off with an everyday nightmare that our very own Jocelyn has recently experienced. So, Jocelyn, I hear that you had some housing issues. I really want to hear your story and what happened. Well, first of all, I just want to say how excited I am for this segment because at the end of the day, like if we spend too much time talking about policy, we lose the fact that these are not abstract political theory questions. These are the things that create the lives we live. And um, so I would love to tell you guys my my everyday nightmare. So two weeks ago, my husband and I are like drinking coffee like we do every morning and water is just like creeping out from our fridge. He's like way more concerned by that stuff than I am. So I'm like, whatever, something probably spilled. <laughs> like before we know it, our front hall is just filled with water. And like, we have a lot of books in our very small studio apartment. So like on the floor are my childhood journals, our wedding pictures, scrapbooks, like signed copies of like Naomi Klein books that are just like lost, gone. It happened so fast. And we find out a pipe burst. So I'm thinking like, okay, like that's not our fault. And I go to speak to our leasing office and the woman was very kind, but basically they were like, well, that's why we demand you get renter's insurance. And I'm like, but it, it's not really about the money when we're talking about wedding scrapbooks and childhood diaries. It's about like the distress or the fact that like my husband's still getting caught up on work because he had to spend like, like days just like. We had to pile everything on the floor onto our sofa. Oh, and then there's like mold and they brought in these big humidifiers. Just a nightmare. And I was like, surely the distress is like grounds for breaking our lease two months early. Nope. Nope. If we want to get out of this moldy, flooded apartment, we have to pay two months rent in advance. Which at that point, like our lease, it, we're going to be fine. Our lease ends in a couple months anyway. So we're just going to white knuckle through. But I really wanted to take an opportunity to talk about the fact that like we are in an era where very few people can afford to buy houses anymore. Most of us are renters in a way that's not been historically true. And we're totally at the whims of these major corporate landlords. If you live in a city like DC, because housing is increasingly not a middle class thing. You're not having like a small mom and pop landlord that's just renting out their little condo. You are renting in a building like ours. Equity Residential has buildings all over the country. This is a this is like a mega corporation. Makes so much money and yet our distress like earns us nothing. We have basically no rights. And private equity acquisition of renters is particularly gross. And you see it like all the time on like, I don't know, I happen to have a weird YouTube algorithm because I like military history. So I get a lot of lot right wingers on my YouTube, even though I don't really want it. Uh, and like often like the quick rich, the get uh, rich quick scheme is essentially to leverage themselves to the max buying commercial like real estate properties, like rental properties. And just like doing as little as humanly possible for the building while making as much in a like basically income as possible, paying the manager of the property terrible, basically providing as, just to like basically, oh, that property is going to make me 10K a month. That property is going to make me 10K a month. That property is going to make me 10K a month. And they just have as many properties as they can, provide as worse services as they can to maximize their own monthly income so that they can go take Instagram vacations. Totally, Craig. And like, of the people on this call that do rent, like how many of us have actually met our landlords? Like, I, I think, yeah, I don't even know who my landlord is. I know our property manager has changed like twice in the past like three months of living in this new space. And like Jocelyn, as you were mentioning these like very personal artifacts that got completely destroyed, 
Um, when it comes to things like housing or these like very intimate possessions, like these are things that just do not register as important to like the capitalist hungry machine of these corporate landlords. Like it's very interesting to put something as um, like as a necessity as housing and think about it in the scope of these landlords that are literally just looking for their own profits and truly in seeking those profits want to make our experience as unenjoyable as possible for the means of making it as cheap as possible for them. It's just really awful. Totally. I get that like people have to make a living, but yeah, landlords are on my shit list um, for obvious reasons. And I just think, you know, housing is a human right. I think that this weird middleman type situations that we have so often that really just disadvantage renters is so predatory. Um, so often people are cho like Jocelyn are, you know, forced to choose between subprime living conditions or not having a place to live for a few months or, you know, or spending a ton of money that, you know, maybe they can't afford or that they could use towards other things to be able to get out of terrible living situations. And, you know, instead of putting people first and, I will say DC thankfully has pretty decent tenant protections, like more than maybe other places, but it's just pretty like, I don't know, harrowing to see the kinds of things that landlords can just make you put up with because you can't afford to go somewhere else. And I've dealt with stuff like that all of the time. Um, I'll tell a quick story, but I lived in New York during the pandemic in a brand new construction building and we were the first people to live there. And when I tell you these walls were made of paper, uh, I could hear my downstairs neighbors flush their toilets. That is how, that is how poorly constructed this apartment is. And I'm not exaggerating. I could hear everything as if they were in my apartment. And long story short, I had to pay three months rent to get out of that place because I couldn't sleep. They were college kids. So they were partying all night. Like they wouldn't go to sleep till 6 a.m. I was working from home and it's the pandemic. So there's nowhere else I can go. I had to pay three months, months rent to get out of that lease. And Thankfully, I had the means to do that, but there are so many people who don't. Imagine if I was a shift worker working in that situation where you have kids making noise all hours of the night and you, it sounds like it's in your own house. It's just, it's really frustrating. And I believe in communal living, but I think there's a better way to do it than the current system that is so for profit for some people. Well, and that's such a great example, Tyler, because like, I think we've all had that experience of like, because a building is poorly constructed you're suddenly hearing everything going on in your neighbors. And then that pits us against each other because like, how can you not resent that person being loud at what, even though like in an I ideal world, you should be able to like be up at midnight without your next door neighbor <laughs> listening to you. And, you know, I think another thing like, like this country has always been a place where the inequality the story of inequality is told in the housing market. It has always been near impossible for black people to own houses. It has always been near impossible for poor people to purchase property, even though like most middle-class people build stability and wealth through their homes. And for us, you know, as like millennials and Gen Z, our personal lives are increasingly dictated about where we're able to live. So many people stay in relationships they don't want to be in because they can't afford to live alone. Or me and my husband, we're very happy. We're very in love. Pretty much every single problem we've had in a relationship comes from the fact that we cannot afford a bigger place. We live in a studio apartment together, which like spiritually, like that's cool, right? Like we're learning all these communication skills, but like we shouldn't have to do that. We should be able to afford doors. <laughs> like, no, I'm serious. Like it's, and, and I think about like, this could have easily broken us up. Or if it were a different relationship, if it were a relationship I didn't want to be in, like that could get abusive really fast. But the fact is living in Washington, D.C. or this area, it is $1,800 for a studio and $2,500 for a one bedroom. If we move to a place that's big, that's all our money, man. And that's not how I want to live either. It's ridiculous. And you're starting to see this in the like moving out of rentals too where private equity companies are just buying as many like houses as they can as well and doing roughly the same thing with that like the more traditional not traditional but like housing rental market but also buying market like my neighborhood in 2016 you could buy my house for six hundred thousand dollars i had to waive every inspection appraisal everything 
and give them 50 over closing cost asks or 50 over their asking price for the right to pay $900,000 to buy my house in my neighborhood, which if you think about went up $300,000 or the average cost of a home for the average American in my neighborhood in four years or what, how many years it is. It's like six years. It's ridiculous. And it is in it's part because of these private equity companies too, because they're buying up all the houses. They can sit for years waiting for them to appreciate, you know, if they appreciate 10% a year, they've beaten their, whatever they can invest their money into in the stock market. So it's just, it's bad all around because it couldn't, shouldn't cost as much. I mean, I know friends who are making, they're, they're near one percenters. There's two, they're two percenters and they're like, I can't order out pizza because their mortgage and their childcare combined with everything else eats up all their disposable income, which is, you know, not woe is them. They live a very good life and they have a very large house and it's very nice, but still it's like, you think you're a one percenter. Like I think people in America have an image of where a one percenter is going to be able to decide whatever they want to have for dinner. It's like DoorDash every night, right? Like why even bother? They might have, you know, they, they sort of did have at one point a mother's helper. I didn't even know what a mother's helper was until they got one. And in case anybody knows, it's like your housekeeper who does more like putting stuff up things rather than cleaning things or building things. And so like you think you have an au pair and you have a, you know, not, you know, you got like a butler or whatever on like near 1% money. Nope. Because the house of cost, the cost of living, particularly in housing and childcare is out of control. And DC's not alone. You see, you see this in Denver, like even like cities you don't aren't always on like the most expensive list. Like everybody is like, Oh, you live in DC. When you live in DC, same with New York or San Francisco or LA, right? No, this is happening in Denver. This is happening in small towns like St. George, Utah. Who has ever heard of St. George, Utah? Not me. Um, but my sister-in-law lives there. And they had to pay like $400,000 for a 2,000 square foot house that's over 100 years old, that was like not the best example on the market at the time. And they had to max out their, their spending ability to just get a home for their two kids. And our parents were like, oh, I worked at McDonald's half time. <laughs> and the bank authorized me for a loan. It's awesome. And, and they can't even tell us we have low interest rates anymore. They can't even be like, oh, well, back in my day, I borrowed money. It was 8% in mortgage interest rates. You got these 3% mortgage rates. No, we got the same mortgage rates now. But the house is three times as much. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. And the incomes we're making are not significantly no. larger. That's the craziest no. part to me. Absolutely. And I want to jump in here as well with some stats that I pulled up. 36% of households in 2019, so this is pre-COVID numbers. I didn't find anything more recent, um, but 36% of households in 2019 were renters, with 45% of those households spending about 30% or more of their monthly income on rent. Like, that is truly scary stuff. And as Craig mentioned, um, just like the importance of knowing like what the situation is looking like in the various places that we live in this country. I live in the Bay Area um, and the rent burdens here have grown significantly since 2000. And we've all heard about how San Francisco um, and businesses right now are kind of undergoing a shift, uh, specifically in our downtown area, just in the larger context of like the financial state of the city. Um, and so this reminds me of this article that I read last week where we saw that luxury retailers downtown here in San Francisco, so think Hermes, think Louis Vuitton, are doing really well. Meanwhile, mom and pop shops are closing down. So when we hear about like vacancies in downtown San Francisco, um, like it really is not shared evenly amongst even the businesses there. So just kind of thinking about like what this broader kind of picture is being painted before us of that wider spread income inequality is really frightening stuff. So I picked my apartment because at the time I was going through a breakup and I really wanted to live downtown and be like, you know, DuPont Circle, I'm a single woman. I want to go out and meet cute people and all that, right? Okay. Three years later, 
Like you walk around DuPont and other than like a couple really well-established institutions, like a bookstore called Kramer's, storefronts are empty. The only thing left over are chains because as Rhett is alluding to, business leases are so high that if you're a cool little coffee shop or like a funky little locally owned bar, you can't afford it. So it's not just local people whose like homes are threatened by this exorbitant property heist. It's also like our ability to have a cool downtown where you go to go to grab a coffee or go to grab a drink. If there's no if there's nowhere to go out, we're left with like Starbucks and KFC. And I don't think that's what anyone considers a thriving metropolis. No. And how am I supposed to have my excellent New York uh, deli sandwich? If it's not made by a mom and pop store, you can't, there's no amount of Jersey Mike's that's going to convince me that that sandwich is anywhere in the remote possibility as Loeb's downtown. All right. So viewers at home, um, we're dealing with maybe just Tyler's uh, internet connection. Tyler, we love you so much. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up. So if you're like, why is Rhett jumping in here? That's why. I know you'd rather see Tyler, but here I am. Um, so with that, we're going to wrap up this episode. Thank you all so much for watching. Put your comments in the box down below. Let us know what you are dealing with in terms of landlord situations. Let's just like let the comment section just be like a tell all about like how awful our landlord experiences are, please. Um, like let it be a practice of just like letting it all out there. I'm so here for it. Thank you all so much for watching. Make sure you like, share, and yeah, let us know what you think. Have a great day.